Welcome to Crossroad Connection. We're speaking out for those left unheard. My name is David Scheringer, the host of your program. I'm the president of Crossroad Bible Institute. And uh, I have in the studio with me today a very special guest that I think will open your eyes to something maybe you have never thought about. Do you think that everybody in America, when they go to court, gets a fair shake? Do you think that everyone gets the kind of defense that they need, that's their constitutional right? Well, we're going to talk about that today. Our guest is Jonathan Sachs. Welcome, Jonathan, to the program. Thank you very much for having me. Jonathan is the newly appointed executive director of the Michigan Indigent Defense Commission. Now, for most of our viewers, that's a mouthful. But indigent defense is about public defense of poor people. Could you, um, first of all, let's just get to back to the, get to the basics. What what is why do we have that in the Constitution? What 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 does that mean? Well, our uh, our founding fathers thought thought part of having a free country is that uh, everybody, both uh, the 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 people with uh, the most means and the poorest people at the most desperate time of their lives when uh, they were uh, uh, in front of a court facing criminal charges that they should like you said they should get a fair shake there that they should have an opportunity to defend themselves so the sixth amendment of the constitution gives everybody a right to a fair trial and a right to counsel at that trial what does that mean right to counsel so right to counsel means if somebody is facing criminal charges charges for any sort of criminal offense that can land them in prison or in jail any something that can take away their liberty they should have a lawyer to see them through that process to be their advocate as uh, as they move forward and, and to help them uh, either uh, uh, get the best possible result or to uh, if they're innocent to defend their liberty and uh, to keep them out of prison if, if that's where they should be so uh, a person uh, if they are a person of means they can hire their own lawyer to defend them but this constitutional amendment makes allowance for the fact that poor people who cannot afford to have to hire their own lawyer will get a court appointed lawyer to defend them correct that's right I mean when our system works somebody shouldn't just uh, be sent to prison because they cannot afford the best possible lawyer they should have a lawyer who's going to work for them who's going to uh, protect their liberty just like somebody who happens to have more money and that that's the root of uh, the Sixth Amendment Let's talk about how the Sixth Amendment is doing, mm -hmm. um, and let's talk about it especially. Uh, well, I'm sure you have knowledge about it across the country. This, you know, this program goes everywhere, so I'm sure that there will be people of interest in other states as well, but we're talking specifically about Michigan. Um, it's wor the system's working, right? And so poor people are getting the proper defense they need when they get in trouble. Uh, it's not. I mean, it's... Poor people are getting lawyers when they're faced with the most serious crime. That, that sort of boilerplate obligation is being met. But the problem is everything that that means. It's sort of uh, breaking down at every step. And the reason Michigan now has an indigent defense commission is to do something about that, to try and set up uh, systems uh, at, at trial level that uh, so, so that poor people do get the uh, proper lawyering. So somebody might have a lawyer, but it might be a lawyer who they meet for the first time the night before their trial. This, this happens routinely. This uh, happened just recently on, on a case I'm familiar with. Somebody was charged with murder. They were facing uh, charges that would mean life in prison without parole. And they met their lawyer in a for the first time they were able to talk confidentially with their lawyer the night before the trial they uh, met their lawyer a few times before court hearings maybe in in uh, a room called the bullpen where there are a lot of other prisoners talking to their lawyers at the same time and everybody has to rush to get in front of the judge but the first time they actually sat down with their lawyer was the night before their trial where uh, they were looking uh, to lose their liberty for uh, the rest of their life and where uh, they had an alibi defense that uh, they said I, I didn't commit this murder I wasn't, I wasn't even there wow 
And uh, so that that happens. Other times, a lawyer might be untrained. There might be a lawyer who is appointed to represent somebody. Uh, let's say on a, on a very serious case in Michigan, that, that may be kidnapping, carjacking, uh, aggravated assault, gunpoint robbery, and uh, somebody may meet their lawyer. That lawyer may be fresh out of law school, very, very well-meaning, but not trained, not experienced with uh, how a jury trial should work, not experienced with uh, maybe it's a mm -hmm. sexual assault case with DNA evidence, not experienced with that sort of forensic scientific evidence. Uh, and uh, a well-meaning lawyer isn't enough. It needs to be a lawyer who uh, knows what they're doing, who's properly trained, and who has the time to spend with their client to, uh, uh, to, to properly represent them. And to, you know, to mount a, a credible defense yep um so they get a fair shake the um this is a let's explain to the if you can explain to the viewers uh this is a this is a commission appointed by the governor governor snyder correct Th that's right so uh uh th because there had been some reports written ab uh, about michigan and looking at michigan's system and also there was a, a lot of publicity for the wrong reasons there, there were some devastating circumstances in michigan where people spent uh 10, 15, 20 years in prison, and later they were exonerated. This has happened across the country. And that could country. be traced to a poor public defense. In some cases, yes. In other cases, it's scientific advancement, things along those lines. But in some cases, in Michigan, there have been now uh, recorded 55 exonerations, 55 people who were wrongfully convicted of crimes they did not commit, 55 where there's no dispute, it's, it's been traced and tracked. And of those 55, I, I took it, they've been categorized, and I took a look at the list, and at least uh, 19 of them are directly connected to lawyers who didn't offer the best possible defense, maybe didn't investigate alibi witnesses, maybe didn't uh, uh, call, for instance, uh, somebody's guilty of arson, and a lawyer didn't speak to a fire scientist who might be able to say, you know what, this looks like an accidental fire to me. That That's wow. happened in a few cases. Um, and so uh, there was a lot of publicity around some of these situations in Michigan, and the governor appointed an advisory commission to look at the problem, uh, to look at the problem of defense of poor people, to find out what was going on. And uh, the advisory commission and also a group called the National Legal Aid and Defender that looked at the Michigan system to sort of see what was happening, found that Michigan was failing uh, uh, its, its poorest and most desperate citizens accused of crime, that lawyers were untrained, that lawyers' caseloads were too high, that sometimes lawyers had the wrong incentives. If uh, there might be a judge who, uh, had, who would appoint lawyers to a number of cases and that lawyer knew that, well, this is, this is part of my salary to, uh, uh, to work for this judge. And, and then you have lawyers who, became, who began working for their judges rather than for their clients. Wow. And, and so, so their cases get thrown their way. So maybe they have an incentive uh, rather than to take a case to trial to figure mm. out a quick plea bargain. Yeah. Or maybe they have the incentive if, if a court is going to have to spend some money for uh, an expert witness like a, a fire scientist to, to look at an arson case. Right. Maybe a lawyer has an incentive to know, well, I know that if I make this court spend uh, uh, $1,000 on a fire scientist, I might not get appointed on the next case. And oh, my. It's that's, that crass. Yeah, it it's, can be pretty bad. And that's not to say that happens every day in every oh, yeah. court, but it happens enough that, that there, the result is a very, very broken system. We have, um, out, of, out of all of our states, there's, a, there's sort of a ranking of the worst. Where did Michigan come in? Michigan came in very close to the bottom. It's hard to know exactly how bad Michigan is, but one factor that was looked at by the national group, the Legal Aid and Defender, when they did their report, is how much money does uh, does is spent per capita on indigent defense uh, per person. Oh, okay. And, you know, it, and it's not always the most accurate because some systems work better than others, but it gives you a good snapshot. And Michigan placed 44th in uh, that list of, 44th. Of, of 50 states. Uh, that's pretty close to the bottom. Yep. So, uh, and that was uh, to folks. Uh, I mean, I came to this commission from... Uh, 
being a uh, public defender first in trial court in Philadelphia and then for an office called the State Appellate Defender Office here in Michigan. So uh, that's no surprise to someone uh, like me who's been working in the system, who's seen uh, clients who were let down, uh, every some of whom may well be guilty, but uh, they, uh, uh, they've committed a serious crime and, and uh, uh, if, if things work properly and they have a lawyer who's properly trained and properly prepared and who has the time to focus on the case, the result of somebody who's certainly guilty may well be a very fair plea bargain um, to, uh, to plea to that, uh, um, to that charge or maybe to plea to a lesser charge. And instead, routinely, you see somebody who pleads to a far more serious charge or bargain that's really not a bargain. And, and, and people who, who sure, they're, they're doing time that they sh that, uh, for something they're guilty of, but they're doing 10 years rather mm. than two years. Yeah, and that's the point I wanted, to, I wanted to bring out. I'm glad that you did. Uh, we're not talking only about we're not talking only about innocent people maybe getting in prison, but people getting over-sentenced. All the time. And in, in Michigan has uh, these particularly complicated sentencing guidelines. They, there are pages and pages long. Offenses are divided into a number of categories. And then there are all these variables making offenses more or less serious. And then there are also a lot of different ways to look at somebody's prior record. And it's a very well-meaning scheme. But, there, but it's also a very complicated scheme. And what mm. happens when you have a public defense system that uh, isn't properly representing poor people is um, lawyers may not understand that scheme or cases may move too quickly that nobody goes through the scheme carefully enough. And, uh, and, and another problem is somebody may end up spending two, three years more in prison because there were errors in calculating these guidelines. We see that when I worked at the appellate defender office, we saw that all the time. We, that officer was responsible for hundreds of years in error corrections, just straight up error corrections. Now, let's be, we could be quite crass about this. Um, now, our interest in this issue as, uh, as, as Crossroad, uh, as, a, as a nonprofit, uh, faith-friendly organization, um, you know, we, we believe, I believe, that the Hebrew Scriptures teach very clearly that uh, it's an abomination uh, to a nation, to God, if the poor do not have proper access to the courts. So this is something that they, this, is, this, is, this gets to the very heart of biblical justice, and that is how poor people are cared for. Now the question I have, what I do, even if you don't, if a person doesn't believe in the scriptures mm -hmm. or have any faith foundation for this or that they're unreasonable, there's, there is this fiscal issue of having people who are over-sentenced, let alone innocent, in a system that I think we spend $30,000 a year on a person incarcerated. Which brings me to our governor, because uh, I had him on our uh, radio program, and I asked him about this. This per I asked Rick Snyder at that time about this issue. I said, and I and I approached it because I knew he was a Republican, mm -hmm. and so I approached it from this fiscal point of view, and said, "Isn't it a waste of money to be putting people in prison, or putting pretty people in prison too long who are innocent?" Um, rather than getting the bad guys. And you know what he said to me? He said, Dave, it's not first of all about the money. He says, it's immoral and it's unconstitutional. Um, that just floored me. What's your opinion of our governor now that he's done and came through five years later and appointed a commission to fix this? Oh, on, on this issue, he's a real visionary. I mean, Michigan has never had a state agency to look at trial level criminal defense for poor people. And now we do. And now we are an agency with a mandate to set standards, to make sure that, I mean, it's, it's, it's going to be a long transition between our mandate and, and to success down the road. There, there's so much to overcome. Yeah, people should know this could take eight, 10 years, right? Oh, easily. And, and it depends on uh, our state legislature putting, uh, putting the money where, where the statute is. Mm -hmm. But for the first time, there's something in place now. And, and there is a mandate. Of, oh, as things work out, we will set minimum standards that uh, the counties and the uh, indigent defense systems will, will need to comply with. And they will, uh, there needs to be proper access to investigators, to expert witnesses, to lawyers who, who spend time with their clients, to lawyers who are properly 
trained to represent their clients, to uh, uh, judges who are fair in terms of uh, appointments that aren't favoring some people or others. And uh, that's uh, the start of that system is with uh, uh, a political process and a governor who, who does believe that this is a human issue and mm -hmm. a Sixth Amendment constitutional issue. Right. And I, th I think you're right. There is definitely an efficient efficiency in an economic argument. Mm -hmm. But but really, uh, the, the thing to think about for uh, for the work of our agency is uh, uh, it's the human cost. And, and yep. why should a poor person in the most desperate time of their life not get uh, the same service that a rich person would get in that in that situation? Well, we've got so much more to talk about. We need to take a break right now. Right. And uh, some of our viewers may be wondering, well, what qualifies you to be the executive director of this important commission? So we want to know a little bit more about your background, but there's more about this issue. Uh, we've just begun the conversation, so we hope that you'll stay with us. We'll be right back. Correcting Bible study lessons is crucial to helping inmates. To partner with CBI in this safe and secure role, please visit us at cbi.fm on the web. Welcome back to Crossroad Connection. We're talking here with Jonathan Sachs, who is the newly appointed executive director of the Michigan Indigent Defense Commission, a governor's appointed commission to improve uh, the public defense of poor people, which is their constitutional right. If they can't afford their own lawyer, um, then the court appoints them one. But our system has been broken, is broken, and the governor wants to fix it, and we're working on it to do that. But let's just uh, back up a little bit, because I just jumped into this topic so quickly, I feel like I, I failed you in introducing you. Um, you. You're married, you have two boys. Mm -hmm. uh, That's right. Uh, what was it? How old were they again? They are almost seven and almost three. And you're a soccer coach for one of them? Soccer coach for one, yep, the Firebolts. And you, uh, where did you go to school? Um, I went to uh, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia, oh. and I went to uh, Columbia Law School. I, for one summer, I took a whole year of Latin at the University of Pennsylvania. Oh, okay. <laughs> so it's a good place. I don't know yeah, if I can call it my alma mater, but uh -huh. <laughs> for, for that's that. connected enough. Yeah, and so you have a JD or something like that? That's or? right. Yeah. Uh, so I have my JD from Columbia Law School. Right. And what were you doing before you were appointed to the commission? So uh, I feel like almost everything I've been doing in the past, almost training for this job, mainly representing clients, seeing what it is like for Working poor in people. a public defender's office, correct? That's right. Seeing what it's like for poor people to face criminal charges and, and to have those and really to, to work uh, every day to, uh, uh, to help my clients who were in those most desperate situations. So I, uh, I started out for, uh, for about five years in the Defender Association of Philadelphia. Mm. That was a trial level public defender office. And there I uh, represented clients uh, facing uh, everything from uh, misdemeanors, uh, very, uh, the, the least serious cases, to very, very serious uh, armed robbery, uh, much more uh, attempted murder offenses uh, that are known there as major trial offenses. And I supervised lawyers there hmm. for a time on uh, less serious felony cases. Right. The, the so you were well prepared for this because you, you saw every day the the good, bad, and the ugly of the public defense system. I did, and and I feel like I, I was lucky enough to work in an office, and two offices, first in Philadelphia, and then in Michigan I worked for an office called the State Appellate Defender Office that does public defender appeals. And those were two offices that were well-resourced, that were client-centered in their representation, that, that made sure it was about the client, not about being beholden to judges, or not about a lawyer trying to uh, uh, take as many clients as they could because they needed to do that to make ends meet. The, it offices that were client-centered and that were really, really focused on, on getting the best mm. possible results for their clients facing that loss of liberty. And, and so that, for me, was the training to uh, be a part of offices that were doing things right. And well, uh, you certainly seem to be the right man for the hour and for this, for this particular job. Um, it, it's my impression, I've been in, working in prison ministry for the last 15 years, that the general public seems to be unaware of this problem um, until they have a son or daughter perhaps in the system. How, how, how is, does this, why has this not been on the radar? Why is it, or, or, or is it just my imagination that's not on the radar? No, I think, I think you're exactly right. It's getting more on the radar, I, I think, for two reasons, and neither of them are good reasons, but 
it is good this issue starting to get some publicity. One is we're starting to see just how many innocent people have been convicted. Mm. And, and of and course, that's a fiscal thing because of the money problem. So they started looking into what's going on, right? Partly that and, and partly people are coming out who've lost 10, 20 years of their mm. life or some of he, whom even were on death row who might have lost, uh, lost their lives altogether. And it's been definitively proven that they're innocent, whether it's DNA evidence or the real uh, culprit being found or right, right, other right. scientific evidence, whatever it may be. So one is, and, and folks are trying to figure out how could this have happened? We're supposed to, you know, this is the land of liberty. How could this have happened that, that so many innocent people have been in prison? Another dynamic is uh, we're, we're becoming uh, more and more a land of incarceration. Uh, the mass it, incarceration problem. Yeah. Michigan now spends more money officially on uh, corrections than on higher education. And once that starts to happen, people uh, start getting more connected to the prison system mm -hmm. through friends, through family members. Uh, uh, if things that never might have been a crime years ago or never might have, even right. if they were a crime, never would have been a reason for someone to have been incarcerated years ago, now are, whether it's uh, simple possession of drugs or uh, whether it's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, maybe a, a mutual you know, bar fight that should be worked out, handshaked afterwards. You know, yep. Whatever it may be, uh, now uh, uh, the criminal justice system is, is coming in. Uh, folks are uh, going to prison and, and people are, are starting experience that sort of shock you just described they yeah. always the system should have been a system that worked and then all of a sudden somebody only met their lawyer the day before trial or somebody was told well okay I know you say you're not guilty but you need to take this plea deal or you're gonna go away to prison for 10 years right and Threaten and suddenly uh, uh, it's it's uh, th there's a system that someone doesn't understand that's going to result in incarceration and there's nobody to uh, to be a navigator of uh, to be a guide in that system uh, this uh, particular problem uh, in a state like Michigan, it varies from county to county. Am I correct? Can you can you uh, paint that picture for us? What's going on? Sure. So the services vary a lot in different counties as, as to how they're offered um, and also as to the type of county. Obviously, uh, Wayne County, which includes the city of Detroit, is going to be very, uh, the city of Detroit is going to be very different um, from a county like Jackson, that, that the city of Jackson or a county like Marquette in the Upper Peninsula. So, so counties uh, are different depending on population, obviously depending on uh, socioeconomic uh, factors, uh, depending on age, issues like that. And then counties uh, have sort of selected their own public defense delivery system. So mm -hmm. some counties, mm -hmm. uh, such as Washtenaw County and Muskegon County, have a county-level public defender office. This is an office of attorneys employed by the county who uh, have the public defender uh, responsibility for that county. And they uh, represent... Uh, the poor people who are arrested there. They might have uh, investigators working for their office. Sometimes they might even be able to use uh, social workers. And, and that's one model. In other counties, there might be a roster of attorneys who might have their own law practice or they might only take a, appointed cases. And it may be all members of the private bar who have, uh, and in Wayne County it's over 100, who, who do the, the lawyering there for uh, poor people accused of crimes. Mm -hmm. In others, a law firm might have a contract with, uh, with a particular county to do that work. Um, it's the Michigan Indigent Defense uh, Commission and, and the statute that runs us makes it clear there's not necessarily a preferred system. But, but whatever the system is, it needs to be a system that's going to meet minimum standards that uh, the commission will be setting up. So these standards might include, may, might need to make sure a lawyer is properly trained or a lawyer has the right amount of continuing legal education or a lawyer's appointment is independent of a judge who might also be making the decision on whether or not to hire expert witnesses. And whether it's uh, a county that's a public defender office or a county that is uh, appointed attorneys or a law firm that has a contract, the key is not necessarily the type of system, but that they meet those minimum standards. And so the commission's mission will be to try and make sure that happens and to work with the counties to put together the best system to make it happen. Uh, there could be a combination. There could be, in, in very high volume counties, I expect there could be a public defender taking a chunk of cases and then also appointed counsel 
taking a chunk of cases. Uh, I'm, I, I come from a public defender office background. I think that's an office that can often be really successful representing poor people if properly resourced. But, uh, uh, but, but what matters with the Indigent Defense Commission statute is whatever the system is to make sure it meets those, uh, those minimum standards. There can be a tension between the state and the counties. Um, and the best way I, f I can describe it is that at the federal level, we always hear about states' rights versus the federal government. And so there are those that want to leave things to the states, and there are those who want the federal government to make decisions for everyone. Um, that same dynamic, is it not, going on in a, in the, in a state between the, the state, the governor's office or the state, uh, and each county. Each county likes to have their, uh, their own... Um, territory um, and so there can be that that tension um, but you feel that that tension is going to be relieved now th that we have some s minimum standards to enforce correct I'm hopeful that the two things are going to relieve that tension number one is the Commission will get standards in place that the uh, counties will need to comply with and number two is uh, this indigent defense commission statute calls for grants to force that compliance so we're not going into counties and say we're the state agency you have to spend more money you have to fix things mm. uh good luck to you. if you don't do it right we're going to take we're going to take over we'll provide them with the money that's the that that's uh, assuming the state legislature fills their mandate that the statute calls for we will be providing grants and and for instance there might be a standard set saying if uh, there is uh, if if somebody is is faced with a crime that's going to mean a loss of liberty there needs to be an investigator where appropriate appointed for the defense that might be a minimum standard and a county might say look uh, the reality is we we agree with that but our budget as it is uh, um, in, in, in these economic times, we can pay for some but not all investigators. We need this much more money. And then the Michigan Indigent Defense Commission will be the agency that gives the grant so that the county in that situation can, uh, can get the investigator. So when you have the, uh, the case where uh, uh, somebody is accused of, uh, uh, of, of a violent armed robbery and there's some blood on the scene, a defense investigator can see if that DNA actually ma matches the poor person who's been arrested, if, if maybe that's going to exonerate them where, where that might not happen right now. Well, our time has quickly run out, Jonathan. I'm so glad that you're here and I hope that you'll come back again to keep us updated on the progress of this extremely important issue, so important, it just tugs at my heart. You know, it used to be kind of a joke that everybody in prison says they're innocent, right? Mm -hmm. But there are probably more people that really are innocent or over sentenced than we realize and that's no joke no none at all it's it's a serious problem and uh, and just a b as big a problem are the people in prison who uh, are there for much longer than they need to be because their lawyers were unprepared or their caseloads were too high or the system worked to uh, to get a result uh, where poor people didn't get the same justice as, as rich people. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much for being with us and we hope to see you again and thank you. Uh, we're going to put some information up for you and go to our website if you want to know more about this. There's going to be a we MIDC doesn't have a website yet, does it? We'll have a website very soon. Do you have a, an address on that? I do. I believe it's going to be uh, www.midc.gov. Okay, so there you can uh, keep in touch with this issue. Be praying about it. Um, think about that when you're writing your, your, your student in prison. This is a serious justice issue, and we need to be a prophetic voice. Thanks for being with us, and we hope that you'll be back with us again right here next week. <laughs>